All right. Um, just um, to follow up on a few announcements from last week, um, as I was presiding last week and I announced um, that Elisa and Chung In were at the hospital currently. Well, it turns out she did give birth while we were worshiping. And so, because remember, I, I prayed for her while we were praying for the offering, and I'm like, if she's in labor now, you know. But she was, and she did give birth, and we welcome a beautiful baby, Olivia. Olivia was born. She's doing great. Um, mom and baby are home. So congratulations to Elisa and Chung-in. Also, uh, we were praying last week. I also prayed for Janice and Keith's baby. Baby Ezra was born almost two months premature, as you know, and he was in the NICU. Um, in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, and we had been praying that he would meet all the, you know, hallmarks or, or the marks, whatever, to, so that he can be able to come home, and he came home. So, yes, his jaundice is good, his weight is up, um, just his breathing, his oxygen, everything. So thank you to those um, who prayed, because baby Ezra is home as well. I got to meet and pray for both of them, I have pictures. It's been really weird. PQ and I were just talking about it, actually. Because of the pandemic, it used to be just automatic. When any of our people had a baby, we were on it. We were at the hospital, like, the day or maybe the day after, and we would take, you know, the picture, holding the baby, pray for the baby, and bless the baby, but we just haven't done that. You know, some of you guys who've had babies during the pandemic, you know, just we weren't allowed um, to do that, so it's just been kind of weird and awkward, and again, because uh, the especially Ezra, pre being premature, and so you won't see them coming to church for a while because of their um, low immune system, but having to wear masks and stuff. So just that, letting you know, at Hope Church, we have several women all lined up, ready to give birth in the next month or two. And so, yes, we're continuing to pray for just healthy delivery, healthy mama, and healthy um, baby for everyone. All right. As Pastor Q said, we are celebrating today Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to everyone, as well as celebrating Juneteenth. I know that is something that is super recent, and so a lot of people don't know what to do with that. We just know we get a government holiday off, but it is a celebration, totally valid. Um, and so we celebrate Juneteenth and what that means. Um, it was a very late addition to the federal uh, holiday calendar, but nonetheless very important day that we do celebrate so yes Juneteenth and Father's Day all right I spoke last month I usually preach once a month I spoke last month on the topic or the title was why you need a church family do you guys remember that why you need a church family to kind of jog your memory that was the title of my message last month I talked about how we cannot make it in this world um, or make it in this life without Jesus and without the family of God, meaning our church family, and how it really it is the church family, even maybe more so than our biological uh, family, our people who live in our household, even more so that our church family is the instrument that God uses here on earth to, um, so that his purpose here for us um, and his purpose, which is to seek and to save the lost, that all may come to a saving knowledge of him, would come true and would come to pass. So I clarified, as I said, that when I said family, why the family, uh, why the church family is so important, I clarified again that it was the body of Christ, it was the family of God, we are brothers and sisters here. I challenged you about moving from nursing you know, a lot of baby analogies, moving from nursing to eating solid foods, right? Eating solids. About how over the years, many people in the church have gotten really kind of complacent, comfortable, and they've been well-fed. And in fact, I think, and I actually said, that some of us have become too well-fed, that we are actually, we have been overfed, and we have become overweight. There was some fat shaming going on where I said we, some of us have become fat Christians. Fat because we are feeding and we're being well-fed all the sermons, all the Bible studies, all the um, just being well-fed, having people pray for you, being ministered to, all this happening. Um, but then we in turn, after receiving all this good stuff, we're not exercising. We're not growing, and we're not being active about our faith, right? I said that we must move from being a consumer to what? You guys remember? It was another C word. Move from being a consumer to a? No one 
anyone took notes? No one remembers? I mean, okay, it was a month ago. You have to move from being a consumer to a contributor. I said that you have to stop being a spectator up in the stands, and instead you have to be a player on the field. Um, you have to move from being just a member of a church to being a cross-carrying disciple of Jesus. Not just a member of a church, but a disciple of Jesus. I challenge you to take off your bibs and instead put on your apron. Oh, that was quick. That's the only thing that you remember. <laughs> it's a good imagery. That's why it's one of my favorites, you know. You see the picture of baby being fed. It's, it's time for many of us to take, rip off that baby, um, you know, bib and put on an apron instead and really start to serve others. Thank you, Tiffany. And again, I truly believe that being part of a house church, this whole house church thing that we are moving towards, that it will help us to grow in this, that it will afford us tons of different opportunities. It will um, make available to us different ways that where every single one of us will be able to play a part, have a role in it, uh, have a position in having this all come to pass, that we will be active in our faith to live out and to fulfill God's purpose for us and for our church. And I was telling you, it's really one and the same. God's purpose for us, our lives, individual lives, but also God's purpose for the church because it is we that make up the church, right? So it's one and the same thing, purpose being the same. Now, we know from Pastor Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, it's a book that we're all familiar with. We've done the campaign actually at least twice at Hope Church, if not more. The Purpose Driven Life, and it... Through that book, we learned that there is a God-given five-fold purpose to our lives, a five-fold purpose that God has given. Who knows them? Anyone? All right, worship, fellowship, serve. That's number four, but you don't have to go in order. But yes, worship, fellowship, Discipleship was the third one, and then service or slash ministry. And the last one starts with the E. Evangelism, yes, thank you. So those are the five. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, and ministry slash service or serving, and then evangelism. So today I'm going to be speaking on number four, about ministry, also known as serving. So this is the uh, slide for the title of my message today. The title is Improving Your Serve. I thought that was catchy and I thought that was cute, but Pastor Q was like, isn't there a book? Someone wrote a book with that same title. And I'm like, I'm sure I'm not the original, the originator of, I'm sure many thousands of sermons have been preached. Books have been written, articles have been, you know, with this uh, title. But yes, Improving Your Serve. And the two passages that we're going to be looking at from the um, book of Matthew will be chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, and then also chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. So that is the title, um, Improving Your Serve. Now, I want to look, uh, oh, well, some of what I'm speaking on today is going to come from Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, also The Purpose Driven Church, like I said, that we are familiar with, so beware of that. And I want to look at this first passage in Matthew, chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. You can follow along. This is the New Living Translation. Normally, I do the um, NIV but uh, this one is going to be the NLT. So chapter 20, verses 20 through 28 in the book of Matthew. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? Jesus asked. And she replied, in your kingdom. Please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied. We are able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. 
and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, <clears throat> we see in this passage that the mother of the disciples, James and John, the two brothers, she comes to um, Jesus and she asks a favor. She asks if it would be possible that her two sons, James and John, that one would be able to sit on the right of Jesus and one would be able to sit on the left of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. And upon hearing this request that this mother makes of Jesus, the other disciples become indignant. In fact, they become angry towards James and John. But why do they become angry? They only become angry because they too want those positions of favor. They too want those positions for themselves. Verses 26 and 28, a reminder, it says, Jesus called them all together and he said to them, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, we know that Jesus exemplified the ultimate, the perfect life of a servant. No one can accuse him of just, you know, walking around like, okay, everyone needs to bow down to me, serve me, serve me. I am the king of kings and lord of lords. You know, no one can accuse him of having that kind of attitude. He was a humble, 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 humble leader. And we are called to be like him, are we not? Not, we are to be his disciples. He is our rabbi. He is our teacher. We are his followers. We are his disciples. And so we are mentored by him. We follow his lead. We, we look to his example and we try to emulate him. So we're called to be like him. Did you know that the Bible describes Jesus' followers as servants, uses the word servants to describe the followers of Jesus more than the words disciples or even Christians? combined. The words disciples or Christians combined still is less than the number of times that the Bible uses the word servants when referring to the followers of Jesus. So to be great in the kingdom of God, we must serve. It's all about being servants. It's all about serving. And so what might this serving look like? What does this serving entail, you might ask? Well, we'll look at our next um, passage. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. In our second passage this afternoon, Jesus lists some acts of service, acts of service uh, here in this passage. So we're going to read the whole thing. When I think about acts of service, how many of you guys think about the five love languages? Right? That immediately just comes, is we're so ingrained, right? Acts of service, and you think five love languages. Yes, it's even a language all unto itself. It's an actual language, right? The acts of service, of serving others, of, of just, you know, putting yourself out there to, to give and to serve. All right, we will read this. Uh, 25, 31 through 46. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Now remember, these are the two positions that um, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, were wanting, right? Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. That is really harsh, you guys, if you think about it. That is harsh, right? 
For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will reply, then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Now, some of the acts of service that are mentioned here include what? Feeding the hungry, right? Giving water or drink to those who are thirsty. It includes showing hospitality to the stranger. It includes clothing the naked or visiting those who are sick, visiting those who are in prison. These are examples of service, the different service areas that we are to be engaged in, that we are to be involved in individually, but also as a church. Individually, but also as a church, as a community, as a body of Christ. These are ways that we would be serving him. So when we serve his people, it said right here, we just read it, when we serve his people, we are really serving him. Verse 40 said, And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. How seriously do we take that? This is such a familiar passage. We read it all the time. Who doesn't know this passage about separating the sheep and the goats? And this image is just so ingrained in us, those of us who grew up in the church. We know this. We're familiar with this, right? But rereading it, you realize how harsh it is, what he said, right, when he separated, how harsh it was. And how, what does it really mean when he says, when you did it to these, you were really doing it to me? Is Jesus right here, right now? sitting here with us, that we could go to him and that we could serve him in that way. But he was saying, you know, we use the phrase all the time, let's be his hands and his feet. Let's be his hands and his feet. What does that mean? You know, growing up, you know, people accuse us a lot of Christians of having this Christian jargon, right? And you realize that a lot of the phrases that we use really are kind of freaky to non-Christians or those who are not in the church. You know, we talk about being drunk in the spirit. We talk about, you know, um, casting out demons. You know, we talk about different things that in any other, you know, context, like if you're just talking about it with people who are not familiar, familiar and in the know, you know, that's a really kind of, you know, it's far out there to say stuff like that or people are manifesting in the spirit. People are barking like dogs or rolling down the carpet or, you know, just various things that out of context, people are like, huh? You know, it's unfamiliar to a lot of people. I realize we use a lot of jargon. And so, like I said, when we say things like, you know, even communion, we say that we are breaking the body and drinking the blood of Christ, you know, symbolically, or, you know, we're eating, you know, taking, partaking and sharing the body of Jesus. And the vocabulary, the language that we use. But I feel like so often it has become so commonplace and so familiar, right, um, that we just gloss over it and a lot of that meaning is lost to us, right? So when Jesus says, when you do to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are doing it to me. Do we really have that mindset? When I am serving a stranger, when I am, you know, doing something for someone, you know, somewhere, do I think, oh, I just served Jesus. All right, you know, I was just able to help out Jesus, you know. Um, one of the, uh, we were talking about, I was, for our house church Friday night, the first time we met, one of the things is icebreaker time right? And we have to come up with an icebreaking question. And for my house church, um, for that first meeting, I vetted, I looked through a whole bunch of different questions to ask and, you know, selected a few of them and allowed my house church members to pick. But one of the questions was, what is the um, most recent kind thing that you did for a stranger? What is the most recent kind thing that you did for a stranger? Think about that for a moment. Can you think of most recently, what is one thing that you did for a stranger that you feel was, was kind? 
Well, if you picture whoever that person was that you did the kind act uh, for, you picture Jesus' face instead. You picture Jesus being the recipient of that kind uh, act of service. For me, I was thinking, oh, the last thing that I did that was kind was I was in the parking lot at Costco. My mom is an avid farmer, right? And she, every year, needs help because my mom's, like, in her 80s. And you know those, like, it's like 50-pound soil, you know, the, the dirt and soil fertilizer, whatever. She has, to, she has to buy like 10 bags of, of it, you know. And again, she doesn't have anyone to help her. And so she always waits until like maybe Hoon can go or uh, I'm freakishly strong. I know I don't look it, but I am. So I go with my mom and I can lift it, right? And so, but it's hard, but I can lift it by myself, believe it or not. The hard part is getting it out of the cart and into the trunk of the car. I can carry it, but it's this part. Anyway, so the kind, the, the most recent kind thing I did was I was in the um, parking lot of Costco and there was this woman and she was, you know, older than me. She wasn't like old, 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 but she was old and she had the Costco shopping cart and she was trying to, she was like, <sighs> And she had those 50-pound bags of soil, and she was, like, trying to figure out how to get it into her, um, the trunk of her car. And so I saw her from all the way over here, and I ran towards her. And I was like, oh, I said, let me help you, let me help you. And she was so startled. I said, let me help you. She goes, oh, no, it's okay, it's okay. Probably thinking, I'm a tiny, you know, she, she's not going to be much help. I'm probably better on my own. This little girl going to hurt herself. That's probably what she was thinking, right? It's a liability waiting to happen. I was like, no, no, no. I said, I understand because, you know, I have to do this myself too, and it is super heavy. And then she was like, oh, okay. So together, we loaded five of those bags into her trunk, and she was super grateful. So that's what I can recall as the most recent act of kindness to a stranger that I did. But think about that. If Jesus needed help moving some soil and some heavy, you know, bags of whatever, that we would be able to do that. Colossians 3, 23, 24 says, this is another well-known passage, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. You are serving the Lord Christ. So I want to speak a little bit about why we should serve people, why Jesus served people. Ultimately, we know that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That was his purpose. That was his mission. The Father sent him on that mission to seek and to save the lost. There was a plan even before creation of how we were going to be reconciled um, with our Heavenly Father, right? And so we read in Matthew 20, 28, that Jesus came to serve the people and not to be served by them. We hear that over and over again. Serving people was a way for Jesus to eventually save them. It was his way, these acts of service, right, to eventually save them. When people saw his love, when people saw his compassion for them, um, how he served them, how he cared for them, how he loved on them, they gladly followed him. They gladly followed him, right? These days, you know, people say um, you have to, what is it, walk your talk or uh, um, practice what you preach. There's like all these little uh, sayings, you know, walk your talk, practice what you preach. Um, they don't care how much, what, they don't care what you have to say until they see how much, or something, you know what I'm talking about. There's like all, this, all these different uh, phrases about that. But it is true. You know, what we say doesn't carry as much weight. People want to see it in action. Is that true? That's true, right? I can say all I want with my lips. I love you. I love you. I love you. You are the most important person in my life. But if there's nothing showing for that, you know, and that is true, right? And so when Jesus went and he just poured out his love and compassion, he always stopped for the one. He was never too busy. I mean, he had throngs of people all wanting attention from him, vying for his a little bit of attention and stuff like that. But he always had time for people. And so people knew that and they gladly followed him. And so it is through our service. It is through our service that it may cause people to stop and wonder and want to know more about Jesus because of our act of kindness or because of these things. Now, I, I was thinking about this too. You know, a lot of times the things that we do, we think that we're doing it because we're just nice. Or like I said, the kind thing of moving those um, bags, 20, 50 pound bags of soil, maybe, you know, I, I needed to work out that day. 
you know, and I felt like it. Or maybe I'm just, I'm just a nice person. But it's not. I think that we have to be um, clear about the fact that as a follower of Jesus, the reasons that I do things, the reasons that I will go out of my way, the reason that I will sacrifice, the reason why things, it'll cost me, and yet I will do, is because I'm a disciple of Christ. Does that make sense? Not just because I'm just altruistic, I'm a good moral person, and I'm just nice. I'm just generous that way. There's a difference. Because you could be generous. You could be very hospitable without knowing Jesus, right? And so I think that is where we need to be clear of the reason. It is the why of what we do. Why of what we do. Um, look at Matthew 5.16. Matthew 5.16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Read that again. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Notice that Jesus didn't say that we should let our light shine by quoting scripture to people, by letting people know how much we know, how, how much Bible we know. It's not by let your light shine by attending church every Sunday, right? Um, he says, let your light shine by doing good deeds, acts of service. And this will cause people to praise our Heavenly Father. It says, the good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. All glory goes to him. We point the finger to him. It's not like, I'm such a nice person. I'm so generous. I've got money to spare, you know. But it's always pointing, right, to our Heavenly Father. And it will cause people, all glory to God. By doing good works, we are following Jesus' example of servanthood, and we're letting our light shine in this dark world. I'm sure all of us can agree that this world has gotten darker and darker and darker, right? I don't know if I heard in the news this week about any mass shootings, right? That's rare. Every week, I told you, we're hearing about mass shootings, but I don't think I heard what, I'm sure there were all over the United States, but, you know, nothing that was big in, um, in the news, right? But yes, by following Jesus' example of servanthood, we are letting our light shine in this dark world, and people need that light. People need that light. People need hope. Ron Willingham, there's a guy named Ron Willingham, and he wrote this book. The book is called Life is What You Make It. Life is What You Make It. And he tells this true story um, that took place about 40 years ago, and it's about a member of the church. Um, it's, the church is located in Amarillo, Texas. It's called the Central Church of Christ, Amarillo, Texas. And this person's name is Giles Tate. His first name is Giles. Anyway, he wrote um, about this guy named Giles Tate. He says, one day, Mr. Tate, Giles was going home from work. Um, and as he was going home from work, he saw two children playing in a vacant lot. So he's driving home, sees like this vacant lot, and he sees um, these two kids playing there. And he noticed that they were dirty. They were like unkempt looking. They were, you know, pretty raggedy, the clothes that they were wearing. And they looked hungry. You know when you can tell children are hungry and they're just kind of, you know, um, ragged and dirty looking. So he stopped his car and he spoke to them. He said, you know, hey, where, where do you live? And they pointed to an old abandoned yellow school bus that was parked near um, this alley, this old abandoned yellow school bus near an alley. And they told Giles that they lived there inside that bus with their father who was very, very sick. Giles went in to see, you know, he kind of followed up and he wanted to see the father and see where they live and see if he could be of any help. So he went there and he went to see if he could um, help the, the children's father in some way. And when he looked at the bus, the bus was in terrible condition, terrible condition. The windows had been all broken out and it had been covered with cardboard instead, pieces of cardboard, you know, um, to cover the broken out windows. The beds that they were sleeping on, the makeshift beds, were the, of course, the, um, uh, the bus seats with newspapers on it, and it also had some like uh, weed, like grass clippings and weed to make it more soft for them. And there was newspapers that was on top of that so that the grass clippings wouldn't get on them. The newspapers um, on top. It was just a terrible sight, a terrible sight of where these kids and the father are sleeping. And the children's father was, was too weak to even stand. He was just laid there in the bus. Thinking that he was near death, this guy, Giles Tate, he took the man to the nearest hospital. Took him, you know, put him in his car and took him to the nearest hospital where this man was diagnosed with tuberculosis. 
tuberculosis is very highly contagious, right? And so he was diagnosed with tuberculosis, and they put him in a hospital room and in quarantine. Now, remember, this was like over 40 years ago. Uh, put him in quarantine. Giles, this follower of Jesus who goes to church in Texas, he told the hospital that he would pay for all of the man's medical expenses. I know, right? This sounds familiar, too. It sounds awfully familiar, a lot like the, um, the Good Samaritan story, right? That's what I was thinking as well. And he didn't, forget to, he didn't forget about the man. Not only did he tell the hospital staff, you know, I'll pay for the man's medical expenses, he came to visit the man every single day. Every single day. Not just once in a while to check up on him, but every single day he continued to visit him. And since he couldn't go into the room, it was, you know, quarantined, he would come and he'd stand outside and talk to the man through this screened window where, you know, air couldn't pass, but you can hear voices. And so he stood there and talked to the man every day. The man asked Giles to bring his Bible and asked him to read the Bible to him every time he came to visit him, every single day. The very day that the man was released from the hospital, he was good enough, healthy enough to be released, he wanted to be baptized into the body of Christ. That was his first request. Upon being released from the hospital, his request was he wanted to be baptized and belong to the body of Christ. While getting ready to be baptized that day, he told the pastor who was going to be doing the baptism, maybe it was like the hospital chaplain or somebody, he told the hospital chaplain, the pastor, he says, quote, over the years, I heard a lot about Jesus Christ and how he cared about people, but never had I seen him living in anyone like I did Giles, who cared so deeply for me and my children. So oftentimes, it's not that people have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. They just have not seen Jesus Christ living in people people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, right? He said, never. I have heard the name. I've heard a lot about Jesus Christ, how he cared about people, but never had I seen him living in anyone like I did in Giles, who cared so deeply for me and my children. Now, again, as I said before, why did Giles do this? How was he able to do this? pay for the medical expenses. It doesn't mention if the man was wealthy, if he was, you know, like super rich or anything like that. But I, I would bet probably not, probably just some ordinary guy, right? Not a CEO of any company or anything like that. And it doesn't say, I mean, he obviously had a job because it said he was on his way home from work when he saw the vacant lot and saw the children. So he had a job, meaning he's busy, you know? It's not like he's just sitting home doing nothing, but yet he found the time to visit this man in the hospital every single day right? And so when he was asked this, you know, why and how, Giles says, he says, as a follower of Jesus Christ, how could he not? How could he turn a blind eye to that? How could he not? And you know, when I, when I read that, you know, I have to be honest too. I was like, I know plenty of Christians who could not. Me being one of them, you know, I'm pretty busy. I've got husband, kids, I've got things to do. I'm like, and he was like, as a follower of Christ, how could I not? I was like, wow, I know more people who could not, would not, than who would, you know? But it really is, as I said before, it's not because he's a nice guy. It's not that he has all the money in the world. It's not because he has all the time in the world. It's not because of the goodness of his heart. It's because of Jesus. When I do what I do to the least of these, I am doing it for Jesus. He literally is taking that and internalizing that. We imitate Christ who came to serve and not to be served. We were created to serve, folks. We were created to be useful. We were created to make positive contributions to the world. We were not created to take up space, breathe, and then die. What is that? Is that life and living life to the fullest? You know, Christ came to set us free. Christ came to give us life and life abundant, right? Is that abundant life? Take up space, breathe, and then die? If you're a Christian and you're not serving God and you're not serving his people through the gifts that he has given you, then you are falling short of your calling. You are falling short of your calling. It says in 1 Peter 4.10, if you want to look here, it's up on the screen. First Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift 
you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. God's grace in its various forms. There's more than one form of grace. There's more than one, um, you know, it's not everybody has been made exactly the same from one mold. We're all unique. We're all different. We've got so many gifts, so many different kinds of gifts, right? So we need to use whatever that is, all of it, for that purpose. Now, I came across this football analogy from a pastor. It's a perfect illustration. All right, so this pastor said, he said, I was watching a football game recently, and I couldn't help but notice that those who were in the game, 11 active players on each side, those who were in the game were carrying the load for the whole team. You all know any professional um, sports team, there's more to the team than those who are actually on the field playing. You know that, right? But he said he realized that the 11 active players from each side they were pretty much carrying the team. They were in the trenches. They were in the thick of things, you know, so to speak. They were out there. They were doing it. But other team members were on the sidelines. They were, some were standing, some were warming up. You know, you ever see baseball games and there's always a pitcher in the, is it, is it called the dugout or the pitching whatever? What is it called? Bullpen? Yes, where they're warming up and they're pitching and pitching, throwing pitches, getting ready. When they get called up, they have to go up on the field. Yes. So you have people on the field, but you've also got people on the sidelines. Some are standing, some are warming up, some are sitting on the bench. Yet, this pastor said, everyone, he noticed, all are eagerly anticipating a chance to get in the game. Think about that. Whether you're a bench warmer, whether you're on the sidelines, whether all this stuff, if you're part of the team, think about it. Everybody is eagerly anticipating a time when they can get in the game, to be part of the team's success. The pastor goes on to say, and I thought to myself, this is the way that a church should be. Every church member should be in the game. Every church member can contribute to the success of the overall mission and purpose of the church. Every single one of us can contribute to the mission and purpose of the church, to carry out the cause of Christ. And each one, each one of us should be always looking for every opportunity to serve the Lord and to do his or her part to help win the battle against Satan, against sin, and to win souls. Now, I want to ask you guys, do we have that mindset? Are we thinking that? Those of you guys who are sitting here and listening to me speak, it's like very one way. You know, I'm, I'm teaching and preaching. You guys are just sitting, passively receiving, receiving, right? Would you say that you are there ready? You are actively anticipating when I can get into the game. You're going to jump up here and start preaching next to me. <laughs> and you're going to push me out of the way. I have a word from the Lord, Pastor Mimi. And you're going to you know, push me aside and come up and share a word. Are you anticipating that you're going to jump into the game? Now, I'm not a big sports person, but this is the picture that I was getting as I read this pastor's uh, quote. As members of a church, we're all on the same team. A certain number of us may be out on the field actively ministering. But those on the sidelines, we are not disqualified. We are not discounted. We are not just bench warmers. We should not be disengaging ourselves from the ministry. We should not be disinterested in the mission of the church. We are not bystanders saying, oh, that's what they're doing. I'm part of Hope Church, and Hope Church is doing that. But no, I'm not part of that. And you are on the sidelines. No, they should be warming up. Y'all should be warming up. Y'all should be preparing to go in as a sub. When you get called up, you need to be ready and you need to be equipped and you need to be ready to go in as a substitute. You should be looking, actively looking for an opportunity to serve or to minister, a chance to utilize your gifts and get in the game. I also realize that even if the players are out for a game, you know, due to injury, suspension, um, you know, personal, for personal reasons. I know um, I was hearing about some football players, like, you know, they take the day off, whatever, because their wife just had a baby or something like that, right? So for whatever reason, if you're out of the game for, you know, a game, or maybe sometimes an injury is bad enough and you're out for the whole season, right? You're out for the whole season. Still, those people who are out for the game or out for the season, what are they doing? 
They're cheering. They're praying for their team's success. They want their team to go to the championship, even though I'm not in it because I'm injured and I'm on the sideline. They're cheering. They're praying. They're going to the meetings, even though they're not actually maybe playing. They're part of it. They're in it. They are in it. They are rooting, praying, and cheering for the team's success. So everyone is involved. As Hope Church continues to plan and prepare for house church, praise team can come up, and I'm going to conclude with this. As our church, as Hope Church continues to plan and prepare for house church, what role are you playing? What position are you going to try out for? What, what role are you envisioning and anticipating for yourself to be part of the game? Because all of you are going to get in this game, right? So what position are you thinking of? Because as members of this church family, you are not a spectator. You are a player. So if you haven't already, you need to suit up. You need to go get your uniform, put a number on yourself, and you need to suit up and you need to be ready because you will be called up to play. You need to think of ways to get in the game. Every one of us are gifted in different and unique ways. Not all of us can have the same position. You cannot have 20 quarterbacks. You cannot. Everybody has to play a different part on a team. Point guard or, like I said, I'm not a sports person. I don't know what other, any other time. I only know quarterback and point guard. <laughs> That's all I know. Wide receiver? defensive tackle? I don't know. I, that all I got from the blind side, the movie blind side, all right? But knowing the different positions and knowing uh, the different, um, what you have to think about, what am I gifted in and how am I going to utilize that to serve people so that I can be all things, so that I can win some. There is always a purpose. There is always a mission. There is always a goal. So you need to get into the game because this servant lifestyle is not just for the elite athlete. It is for everyone. It is not just for the radical Christian. It is for all of us, for every one of us. I'll close with this, and then we're going to sing a song. This is a quote from Rick Warren. He says, for Christians, service is not optional, something to be tacked on to our schedules if we can spare the time. It is the heart of the Christian life. It's not an afterthought. It's not something that we do when we have leftover time and leftover money. It is the heart of the Christian life. And so with this house church, as we move forward, this is going to allow every single one of us with no excuses, no excuses, it's going to allow every single one of us to get in the game, to put on a uniform and to get in the game. That's why I'm so excited about this. We are going to see amazing things. We're going to see people, you know, just grow, blossom. They're going to be able to utilize their gifts like they have never, um, they didn't even know themselves that they, you know, were so hospitable or that they could lead this or they, they could do this. But all that's going to come forth for the mutual edification of one another as the body of Christ, as as well as those outside the church. That is the key, that we are part of the mission and the purpose that God has created us for. Amen? All right, let's all stand together. Amen. So, Father God, we do honor you, and we thank you for all of our fathers and the fathers who have been part of this, um, of our lives, God, whether physically or even in a spiritual way or coming alongside us. So we ask that you would continue to bless them and truly as they serve others living a life of humility, that we too would be an encouragement to those fathers around us. So we honor them and we honor you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me just give the benediction here. Lord, we celebrate who you are, the Father to the fatherless. You are the mighty and great Father. So we thank you for the blessings that we have for our earthly fathers, God, as we see that our earthly fathers here, God, that they will be a reflection of our heavenly Father. So, Lord, may we appreciate, may we love, may we respect and honor all our fathers everywhere. Lord, would you bless all the fathers, God, all of our fathers. Each of us has one, even if we ourselves are not a father. So we remember we remember our fathers and we bless them. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be upon all of us, especially all the dads today, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.